yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, when um when you asked me, you know, to to speak with you, I, I didn't really realise who you were. You know, I knew you from your Instagram, whatever. But um, but looking into your who you actually are, uh, you know, I'm quite I'm quite shocked, really. You know, and honoured that you want to speak to me. I mean, you, you I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be honoured, mate. It's all bullshit. I was like, oh, right, okay. Well, you're you're in the Guardian, so uh, you know. Oh yes, that yeah, the infamous Guardian. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, I just spoke with, oh, I just texted with Joseph. He said hello. All oh, right, say so hi back. Yeah, nice. yeah. yeah. So, I watched about half of that um, video. You sent me, yeah, very interesting chap, Joseph. Yeah, he's 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 very interesting. Um, not unopinionated, which is always nice. Yeah. And especially but, interesting for a Swede because they're usually kind of straight jacketed in their thought. So, um, you know, yeah, very no, he, he is quite, he's quite unusual in that regard. Yeah. Um, in, in that I think he's very kind of free thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, he's a nice, he's a really nice guy. He is. Yeah, yeah. I, I like him. Do you, do you go back to Sweden very much? I go about now, I go about every uh, once every two years or so. Um, yeah. I used, to, I mean, I lived there for two years and um, yeah. my mother's from Sweden. I was born there, as I say. But right. uh, England, Britain's really my home now, you know. Yeah. Like I say, my father's from London, and I was brought up in Cornwall most of my life, and then London, yeah, myself for 10 years, so yeah. kind of, uh, I've got a foot in Sweden, I can speak Swedish, but, um, you know, I lost the accent, and um, I don't know, as I as I sort of step back from Swedish culture a bit, because my relatives are sort of dropping off there, uh, yeah. it's quite interesting to get, to get an objective view of the place compared to Britain, as I'm older as well, you know, it's a very strange country, Sweden, really. Yeah, it's a, you know I just moved back to London after um, thirty years in LA. Wow! And uh, it's 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 interesting being back here. Um, yeah. Because uh, you know, on one hand, it's it's home and it's familiar, and on the other hand, it's like a foreign country. Oh yeah. Yeah, in in, in many ways, and uh, it's interesting, just the whole mindset at the moment, you know. And, yeah. Uh, all the mad politics. Although speaking of which, mad politics in Sweden right now yeah, as well. Yeah, no, not as bad, not as bad as I think they thought it might be. No, no, but uh, inevitable, really. I mean, you know, the interesting thing about Sweden is it's um, it's always had a far right kind of underside. Always. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons they're so liberal politically is because they have to swing that way to sort of subdue yeah. the kind of right wing natural thought they have. Yeah, and you notice it in little off the cuff remarks when you're there and so on, especially yeah. from an older generation. But it's, um, you know, you, you need this kind of, a, I don't know why it's like that, but um, in my experience it is. And uh, you need that kind of uh, liberal politics to sort of overcome it, which you don't need so much in Britain, because I think we're just more naturally liberal here than in Sweden. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But then the funny, the irony is then that everyone, a lot, a lot of people from Britain look to Sweden and Scandinavia and say, oh, these, you know, idyllic, liberal countries, which is not really the case. Also, the Sweden, especially compared to like Denmark, is especially authoritarian. I mean, you're not allowed to jaywalk there, for example, which I find crazy. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. You can't jaywalk in America either. <laughs> yeah, well, we all accept America's crazy, right? So, exactly. Yeah, Sweden. No. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, the, the illusions of Sweden are, are, are different. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's it's all blondes and and uh, yeah. everybody's taken care of from cradle to grave. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah, no, no, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's an artificial country, you know, like the same, I mean, the Social Democrats won, I think they've won, they have never lost for the last hundred years. So yeah. So one party, you know, it's one party state, essentially. And it's yeah. sort of um, crafted top down, you know, rather than Britain, which is more bottom up, you know, if there's a sort of grass, yeah. grassroots movement that will eventually sort of infect politicians um, who might sort of um, table laws. But in Sweden, it's like, right, now you have to use this word, you know. You have to think this way, you know. And this is immediately set in tech, school textbooks and um, reporters on television, and so on. So it's quite a different setup, completely. Yeah, that's it. that's really interesting. Also, they import it. They they never have. They don't have their own. They never. There's no legacy of high culture in Sweden. They've imported it from Germany mostly, until yeah. the Second World War, where they sort of um, looked to America instead. But um, it's very much based in Germany and sort of um, a kind of. Uh, Marxism from Germany, which has yeah. a ma a ma allow which allows for markets, has worked very well for Sweden in terms of technology and industry and affluence. But it yeah. has, has a price, which is conformity. 
which makes it a bit of a boring country to live in, in my in my opinion. Great for a holiday for a week or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great for retirement, but you know, um, otherwise, I prefer Britain. It's just more eccentric, more, more you know, more thoughts loud and so on. Yeah, no, it's true. I, I, I do, I do, I, I actually do appreciate the the kind of eccentricity of Britain. You know, there's sort of room for. It's all. It's a little mad. You know what I mean. I, I always said that. You know, America is neurotic and Britain is eccentric. And I'll take, ex, I'll take eccentricity over neurosis pretty much any day of the week. Really. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Right. It's not a mental defect, at least. You know. yeah. yeah. And uh, it was also better for philosophy because you know you can sort of um you know philosopher is spoke well it's, you know ideally I think comes up with new thoughts and um of course that's more accepted in Britain. We've got a nice legacy of British philosophers where in Sweden you know if you if you transgress the sort of uh, social um, yeah. understanding you know you'll be frowned upon or you won't get publicity or whatnot and you, you won't thrive there. Well there are exceptions like Alexander Bard perhaps but a very yeah. few. Yeah and Joseph likes him a lot. <laughs> yeah he pops up everywhere in my I don't know in my life Alexander Bard I've spoken to him a few times but he's um yeah, he's a fascinating character in himself. He didn't really belong in Sweden, but he's he's like um <laughs> he's stirred it all up. Which is good, you know. <laughs> you know, he you know where he is a pop star and um yeah. and he was like a judge on Swedish X Factor or Idol or whatever. And then yeah. um now he's like a futurist philosopher, constantly criticizing the Swedish state. Very yeah. interesting. Aaron Flam as well, you know, works in cohorts cahoots with him. But anyway, yeah, so there's an interesting change happening in Sweden, and I think that's partly due to the internet, you know, just um, suddenly you can see different points of view and, uh, you know, and you sort of start, as a, as a result, one starts questioning one's own culture. Yeah, which it's is, true. Which and, is the advantage uh, of the internet, and also disadvantages, of course, as you know. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, thanks, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. I was just... Um, fascinated by um by your book and i don't know I, I can't even remember how i came across you or it I, I i i don't even know um but uh it's just interesting in the whole uh i mean i'm i'm I've sort of, i'm i'm kind of interested in the whole recovery of um psychedelics in general you know that seems to be going on and just think about the implications of all of that but i just thought it might be interesting to have a chat about how you came to that and and uh what you think about all of that and how it fits in with your like philosophical perspectives and stuff if that's all right yeah absolutely would you mind if i recorded this no i was going to do the same so (laughs) But um, I won't release it until you have, or if you want me to, or whatever. But uh, no, you, uh, you can do what you like. I mean, I'm going to record it and not edit; just put it out. You know what I mean? So in- perfect. I do. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I, uh, psychedelics yeah, is an interesting one because um, I, you know, personally, I was never really into psychedelics. I didn't. I don't smoke. Okay, you know, heavy drinker perhaps, but I didn't really smoke much or take many drugs as a as a youth. I'm in my late thirties now. Um, yeah. But um, I actually got into psychedelics through theology, strangely. Um, so, yeah, because um, well, I was when I was in London, I was I was a, a college teacher and uh, teaching philosophy, and they wrote me into teaching philosophy of religion. And part of that was like um, proofs for God and proofs for the afterlife and metaphysical realms. So yeah. you get all the classic, you know, sort of ontological, cosmological arguments, you know, blah blah blah. But there's then William, you know, there are other arguments like um, from direct experience, and um, and this wasn't really an argument. It's just you know, if you know, you know. Uh, if yeah. you've had the experience, you know. And then William James wrote about it, especially you know, noetic qualities. But William James linked it then to drugs, you know, to uh, nitrous oxide, ether, alcohol. Even he says alcohol is the first step of the mystical consciousness, you know, in the yeah. varieties of religious experience. 
1902, I think. Anyway, so that, you know, I, I'd never considered that, you know, and uh, the psychedelic uh, movement in my eyes and my sort of stereotypical eyes then was just some 60s thing and, and all they offered were like, you know, sort of uh, kaleidoscopic visions of, of little interest really, you know, compared sure. to modern movies. But anyway, so that was my view. And that, But then I was reading with James, realised it seems to be more than that, sort of, um, he talked about, you know, so, you know, so-called cosmic consciousness, uh, from, yeah. from Buck, you know, a few years before that, and uh, so anyway, that fascinated me, and um, I was teaching in London, as I say, and I went back to Cornwall, as I always did, you know, and stayed with my family for the holidays, and um, my brother was a sort of amateur mycologist, mushroom expert, and um, as we were walking through some Cornish fields in the fog, uh, he said, Peter, I think those are magic mushrooms, and I said, really? Well, well, okay, that's interesting. And there were loads, you know, like a hundred. I never found that many ever again, but anyway. So I um, picked them, and then I went on the internet to check that they weren't, you know, lethal or whatever. They seemed to yeah. be the right ones. And, um, <laughs> uh, and I brought them back to London, and I took a little dose, watched the film in the cinema, and then uh, it was fine, you know, 3D, so I thought. And then I went back to, uh, and then a, a week later, I took a huge, a relatively huge dose of these, uh, you know, Liberty Caps. And um, just had the most inter immense, unbelievable experience. I mean, you know, world, sh world shaking for me. Um, you know, far be the most beautiful visions, uh, meeting entities, aliens. You know, traveling, having emotions that are completely novel, things that you can't. There are no words for because they're just not part of prosaic consciousness. Yeah. Um, just radical synesthesia, whatever. You know, anyway, yeah. like distortions of space and time. And, and the space and time stuff was interesting, so I was always interested in idealism from Kant and Schopenhauer, especially. And they yeah. talk about space and time as not a real, but something ideal. In other words, what, yeah. uh, one projects them onto the world, but in at the thing in itself is not spatial and it's not temporal, which is hard to conceive. But you know, they they reach that through logic, not not drugs. Um, so it was yeah, it's quite fascinating to then sort of almost intuit that you know the sort of breakdown of space and time. And uh, also the breakdown of the you know, subject-object ob dichotomy. Yeah. So, you know, I did that and um, and then I sort of went to look for the literature and when there wasn't relative, there wasn't much, relatively speaking, although since then I found a bit more. Um, yeah. Especially recently, actually, a guy called John R. Smithies, but I can talk about him in a minute. But um, yeah, anyway, so that changed my view, and I thought, wow, this, you know, this is such a, such an incredible experience that I think many people just don't realise has sort of been um, sort of uh, submerged in some cultural movement. Um, yeah. Well, not that I'm against that cultural movement, but that's how people think about it now. And, yeah. And, and so, so I thought, well, let's let's get a bit more serious with this, as as people once were, you know, like William James, and um, and, and and try to analyse it. And what I, in retrospect, what I seem to have done is um, analysed these experiences through different philosophies, you know. So I yeah. looked at it through Whitehead, I looked at it through Schopenhauer, Bergson, um, Kant to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, recently, I've, I, I've, I've begun to look at it through Spinozism because of... Um, Interesting. Uh, I gave a talk recently um, on Humphrey Davy, so Humphrey Davy, whose statue uh, crowns Penzance, uh, you know, the great chemist. But he yeah. um, he was the first, really, in 1800 to, or 1799, to experiment with a huge dose of nitrous oxide and, uh, you know, to, to psychedelic degrees. And he wrote um, a poem called The Spinozist in his notebooks of the time, just after his poem on nitrous oxide. So uh, I've looked into, yeah, so I, I've begun to look at if one can get anything uh, through Spinozism as well. And um, but Whitehead is the most the person I've mostly um, it's the lens I've looked at mostly for these experiences. Yeah, and was was Whitehead was he like majorly of interest before all of this? I mean, did you was that your main lens, sort of philosophical yeah. lens, or or did that come after? I suppose that came after really because um, I wasn't looking at Whitehead um, as I was as I was in college in London, uh, yeah. but. Now that, interestingly, that was a sort of parallel route uh, which came together with psychedelics. So I, um, I got into uh, panpsychism, uh, yeah. the view that mind is ubiquitous and fundamental. You know, so everything yeah. fundamentally has a basic form of mind, not consciousness, but you know, some basic form. Um, I got into panpsychism through Nietzsche, strangely, and his notion of the will to power, or his last speculations about the will to power before he fell into mental decline. 
But um, but then um, I look back at Schopenhauer for it. He's uh, you know Karl Popper said Schopenhauer is a, pan a Kantian term panpsychist, um, and uh, Berg's on to a certain extent. But interestingly, I realised that this this train of thought was leading to what I had, you know, on the side heard of. Uh, Whitehead's philosophy. So I thought, all right, I, yeah. better, I better really look at Whitehead for a very systematized uh, version of this panpsychism, or for yeah. him, it's known as pan experientialism. And uh, yeah. and then I then I heavily got into Whitehead because um, he's just sort of uh, such an inc it, very. I mean, really, Nietzsche and Whitehead were the, are the two philosophers that really sort of um, you know smacked me out of my you know general consciousness of reality because. Um, they yeah. just they just uh even if they're not right they just sort of throw ideas at you which certainly make you question yeah. everything you know and yeah, um, yeah. so anyway that's how i got into whitehead through panpsychism um but at the same time i had this parallel psychedelic uh, uh interest i realized that i would there's no chance of getting funding um a university for looking at psychedelics or very little chance because it was it's still faux pas it's illegal you know <laughs> Sure. It, it, no one's going to give you money for an illegal activity, essentially, and it, it has to involve field work, as it were. Um, yeah. And if they do scientifically, I mean, it's incredibly yeah. costly, as you know, period people at Imperial College, for example, know. You know, one mushroom costs you know incredibly inordinate amount of money if you get it legally, licenses yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. So I uh, kept that as parallel interest, and I'm not doing it. It's not part of my PhD, but, but. Um, but then I suddenly realised, yeah, you can fuse them together. Let's let's look at psychedelics with whiteheads, you know, and then and then uh, and that led to a few uh, essays and yeah. um, and and ideas. And um, but interestingly, yeah. I've... I really liked your your, your chapter on uh, um, whitehead in your in your book. I uh, thought it was really interesting. I mean, you know, my 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 awareness of of whitehead has largely come through process theology people right yeah rather than you know process philosophy people <laughs> and, and i have a cert, I've, I've, I've always had um a little uh ambivalence i, I guess would be the word in in terms of i think i think it was just i i, I didn't find the theological interpretation of whitehead particularly interesting at, at the times I was exposed to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a strange... I think, I think it, was, it was trying to still hold on to some conception of God that I was very busy shaking off. <laughs> probably, it's probably what it was. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's actually we, quite, quite interesting when I, wrote, I published this uh, essay called The Great God Pan is Not Dead, Whitehead and Psychedelic Experience, because I said in that book that the process theologians had essentially hijacked Whitehead's legacy. Yeah. And, and uh, they didn't like that, um, <laughs> but, 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 but some of them were quite interested in uh, it, this different interpretation of him. But um, the, yeah, the word hijack was strong, but purposefully so, because, you know, um, when Whitehead was writing, he, he was writing at the peak of, you know, reductive philosophy, reductive philosophy of mind, you know, the age of behaviorism, where there wasn't, you know, consciousness was simply an illusion, it can be yeah. reduced to that behavior. So happiness is smiling, or sadness is frowning, or whatever. Um, yeah. Quite ridiculous when we when when it was fully analysed, people realised just led to paradoxes constantly, and so it's dropped now by most people. But um, also, lo you know, logical positivism and uh, and then kind of um, forms of eliminativism again. Consciousness is not real. That's like a neural identity theory. It's essentially eliminativism. So so yeah. he was writing at a time. He was writing uh, at a time about consciousness, the consciousness of the whole of reality, when yeah. this was deemed to be just futile and a uh, sort of quasi-problem or quasi-analysis. Yeah. It just wasn't taken seriously by the academic philosophers of the time, or well, not most of them. Um, so, so, but in, because he, his thought is just so um, thought-provoking, thought it was taken on then by theologians who could get away with more, you know, because... Uh, you know, with the assumption that God is God exists, which is, I suppose, the assumption of many, most probably theologians. Then, um, you know, with that in the bag, as it were, you can start to talk yeah. about other uh, think, interesting yeah. metaphysical aspects. So, so, so that, so, you know, in a way, it's, I'm grateful that they did that. But as as a result of it, they sort of they uh, they pushed, they made Whitehead seem as if he was a theologian himself. Um, yeah. And of course, he does speak about God, but 
was a radically different notion of God than most Christian yeah, and, religions. And I, and I think that, and, and I, I don't have any problem with, with uh, uh, adapting ideas and stuff. You know, you know what I mean, and 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 uh, utilizing utilizing things in the service of your own sort of idea matrix. Of course. But I, but I, but I think it's, I, I guess it, it's that it's the issue of how you handle the God component in both Whitehead and then in the realm of theology that's was the sort of larger problem for for me because uh, as you said you know in your book Whitehead wasn't necessarily addressing a kind of judeo-christian conception of mm. uh, uh, of God but anyway it's, it's interesting so I so it was kind of nice to read uh, why taking in, a, in an entirely different direction yeah. that would probably trouble a lot of protest theologians. Well, interestingly, Whitehead says, um, you know, his philosophy is very similar to Spinozism, and um, you know, Spinoza got into a lot of trouble for yeah. for his um, uh, lexicon. You know, he he said nature was God, and yeah. uh, we, the, you know, if you completely understand that you're determined. That you're, you're free, <laughs> and uh, and so he was accused of being an atheist. Um, yeah. And in a, in, a, in a way, you can say the same applies to Whitehead, you know, although he uses words such as God and whatever, when you really understand what they mean, you can't really fit them into yeah. the classical Judeo-Christian scheme. Although there, are, there is overlap, of course. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it was, it was uh, I, I just really um, appreciated that. So you, you, you did this, uh, just to jump, to jump back, you, you did this kind of... Um, experiment let's just say where or you had this encounter mm. that that changed your perception of reality i suppose and, so yeah and uh and uh, that led you into this kind of new realms of like philosophical thought and and ideas mm. what, what what do you what would you say are are the the key the key things you're trying to um, address in in your work in this particular area of of, of your interest, like what what is it about um, mm. your counter and, and psychedelics that um, is it just connected to ideas about reality or, or um, what? Yeah, I mean there are a number of quick connections. I suppose um, I suppose ultimately. My point, my my point is, I suppose that um, psychedelics can give you ex direct experiences of things that are only speculated in theory, in metaphysical theory. Yeah. And um, so, for example, the distortion of time, um, the distortion of space, the reality of space and time. Um, you know how we think about ourselves as one unified being. How that can be, for example, shattered in psychedelic experience. I mean, I've I've experienced being five selves at once. You know, disparate yeah. selves. Um, so that that in itself shows that you you know this unified self, pure ego, whatever you may call it, is not a necessity for consciousness. Um, yeah. What what psychedelic experience generally does is just um, the first thing it does really is it makes you realize how rich the mind can be, how extreme it can be, and yeah. uh, how much more it can be than, than most people who, have, who haven't taken these large doses at least um, fathom, you know. Um, so yeah. a lot of philosophers of mind and phenomenologists who are, you know, classifying the mind in terms of intentionality and uh, access consciousness and whatever, you know, they're just talking about a very small fraction of, of what consciousness can be. And yeah. so my ultimate hope is um, these chemicals... Uh, induce these much broader states of mind, which then in turn can be analysed phenomenologically, and uh, they might, you know, they they can give uh, what should I say substance to a lot of theories um, about the mind, and um, and uh, they can also provide you know new avenues of thought. I mean, there's a great there was a philosopher called Patrick Lundborg who wrote this book called Psychedelia. He died a few years ago, based in Stockholm, but he he said, instead of trying to um, instead of trying to interpret psychedelic experience through psychedelics, let psychedelic experience, um, as it were, create a new philosophy. So this is another interesting possibility. Yeah. Um, so and it basically just gives you so much more material to work with. 
And so the analysis of that is what is going on going on at the moment. Another thing I'm sort of pushing is the fact that um, what's happened with this new psychedelic renaissance is that uh, in order to, to make it more less faux pas and more mainstream, it's become it's looked under the eyes of medicine or therapy, which is sure. which is a great thing, no doubt. But it's much more than medicine. Psychedelics are much more than medicine. I mean, they it's a bit like um, an analogy I give all the time is with music, you know. So, you know, music, I'm sure music is very beneficial psychologically to people. Yeah. You know, make, you know, you can lift them up or uh, empathize with their moods or whatever. And I'm sure, I think there, have, there are studies showing yeah. how they can increase um, one's yep. um, happiness. Yeah. So, same with psychedelics. Yeah, okay, you know, um, if you have these wonderful experiences, no doubt they can be of benefit to a person. But the interesting thing, as with music, for me, is not their effects. But their nature, the very intrinsic nature. Same with music. Uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of fascinating to me um, the the kind of explosion of interest around psychedelics. You know, we, we talked about that a little bit in uh, emails, and, and I think for me it's interesting because I'm sort of old enough to have had. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't come. I came of age in the '70s, not the '60s, so. Um, my, hippie culture was not my my uh, realm of engagement, but um, I I did in in the seventies have a lot of kind of uh, interaction with, with psychedelics. It was a big in in the in the little world that I ran in. Psychedelics were a, a key a key part, and you know, and a lot of it was very much you know uh, a sort of hangover from the 60s thing you know just kind of get out of your mind and mm. you know it was filled with all the cultural uh associations that you kind of you know make it sort of trivialized and and and, and stuff like that but but for for me it, there was always this element of it that was a bit more than that and if i think probably because i'm a bit of an internal person anyway and so my experimentations with drugs used to be, well, were and were much more about what was going on with me in those things, you know, what, what and, and how it made me think about myself in relation, well, my own self-understanding and, and the world um, do you around think, me. Um, do you think that had an effect upon, because I, I read... That when you're on the when you're on the uh, maybe this is complete rubbish, but I read right that when you were on the road with ACDC, uh, you converted to uh, uh, Christianity or some kind of theology. Were, were, were those drugs uh, partly responsible for that? Would you say? I I I, I don't think so. Um, well, me, no, I think it, at that point in time, and, and that that sort of conversion story. Um, I mean, I, I think I'd probably use entirely different language for it today. At the time, there was a sort of language that you had, and it was the kind of conventional wisdom for how you talked about those ex experiences. Um, I, I, I was really trying to handle um, uh, some other things in my life connected to, to really how I felt about about myself. And my, my drug taking while I was on the road with ACDC was less psychedelic and, and more stimulative <laughs> that was becoming a bit more problematic for me personally just you know too much speed and too much coke and stuff like that so and no not really I, I, I because to be honest I was never um, I was never on a search for God mm. uh, and never have been really even though I've spent 30 years in the realm of theology um, I, I, I was never like oh I need to find to find God. So I was always actually even amongst my more hippie like friends who, who would, you know, want to take acid to, you know, discover that kind of stuff. Mine was much more, um, about, uh, me as me as a, a, a person and sort of stretching yourself, but never written. No. So, so not, yeah, not, not so much really. Um, and I think that was partly because I always sort of rolled my eyes at the, the kind of hippified language around that stuff. You know, I was much more interested, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, that, I, like I was saying, that's one, of the, that's one of the problems, you know, the association. Because the association itself has an effect upon the effect of the drug, you know, when you're expecting that kind of thing. 
Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, you, you have, you, you, I mean, it's like even today, you know, they have, um, I know lots of people that go to the Burning Man mm. Festival, you know, in uh, Nevada every year. And uh, there's, a, you know, a lot that, that in some ways that there's a lot of newness there, but there's also a sort of recovery of a, of a kind of uh, hedonism that has a, a big kind of 60s holdover, you, you know what I mean? And, and a lot of tie dye. Right. So, yeah. You know, and, I mean, you know, I, for I, me, the danger though is actually, and this is, has has started with this Renaissance. There are calls for like manifestos and so on. Yeah. You know, in other words, it it quickly forms into a church, um, which oh. then immediately stifles any kind of novel thought or any uh, digression. That's the danger yeah. of it because I think one of the v values of psychedelics are their ability to allow for total cultural and reality questioning. So yeah, the notion I mean, of a dogma yeah, there, yeah. I don't know, but that that happened. I mean, that's part of human nature, I suppose, that's to sort of form that kind of psycho anarchy. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that. I think that's what it really uh, leads to, at least in my experience. And an inter I mean, an interesting um, thinker with with regard to this is Octavio Paz, who was a no Nobel oh, yeah. laureate, and he's yeah. a bit of a Nietzschean, but he he wrote that uh, psychedelic drugs, specifically psychedelics, break down one's sense of cultural morality. And 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 uh, that for him that included religion and and sort of completely emancipates a person. And yeah. I, I I would tend to agree with that. Maybe because I'm a Nietzschean as well. But um, you see, you don't know what you bring to the experience. You probably bring a lot. I mean, other people say. I mean, it's very common now. It's almost cliche to say that this whole notion that you know with psychedelics you you have a unitive experience, so a oneness with everything. You know, he knowledge. Uh, uh, this is a Western thing. You know, and sort of shamans yeah. and. Mesoamerica, they they don't see it that way at all. They sort of um, curse their their enemies and um, <laughs> and so on. Yeah, and have a yeah, totally... I, yeah I, I think going back to you know the, the uh, me and, and and drugs and and God and all that kind of stuff is I I, I I never sort of bought into that oh the cosmic oneness thing. You know, I always thought my experience was was always intensely subjective and and personal and not the same as uh, my friends. Even though I used to take I used to take um, acid pretty much every Friday night with the same <laughs> friends for a number of years. Every you know what I mean? So we had, communal, uh, we had a communal ritual, but um, it didn't lead. I don't think it. I, I don't. I can't say that we ever sort of arrived at the same <laughs> at the same cosmic point in, in in those those journeys. But that's interesting in itself, isn't it? That you had. It, yeah, it, it is. Trip. And you know, there's. So, I, I think that's what's so interesting about. Uh, about psychedelics it, it is that we we do try and corral experiences and and sort of channel them in certain ways and, and and I think that's that's part of you know again that's one of the obstacles even with this recent recovery is how to deal with uh, the the baggage and it's like everything you know everything accumulates baggage. Mm task when you rediscover it is to find new language to, to, to speak about it but also new language that that kind of negates or at least disarms the 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 previous way of speaking about it I mean, absolutely and that's why whitehead c comes up with this whole new vocabulary because um yeah what well, every word has this baggage bergson said you know if you have if you haven't come up with your own terms and concepts you're not really doing philosophy you're just using other people's concepts you know which i think is quite right um, yeah, even think, even the yeah. word psychedelic is problematic because yeah. it immediately has connotations to the 60s then and tie dye and whatnot. But what are the alternatives? If you use like entheogen, uh, which is yeah. common as well, which means you know generating God inside, you sort of already you've biased the experience. You're saying it's a generation of God, you know. So yeah. that, so that's not a particularly neutral word. Uh, if you use hallucinogen, it implies yeah. that everything you see is not real, whereas what you actually see normally is real, which is yeah. again biased, you know. So yeah, the, what's and that, I mean that was to me was the, the the fascination is not that that it was hallucinogenic, but that it was <laughs> expansively um, real. I mean, I, I think that's the interesting thing. I had this friend who went, um, he, he went, and this is like a while ago actually, before it became kind of voguish. But he went to uh, Brazil, um, and did an ayahuasca thing because he was struggling. He was actually struggling with, uh, with uh, 
an addiction to crystal meth. And he'd sort of tried rehab and all these kind of things. And, and somebody told him that he needed to go do a, 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 shaman, a shamanic thing. And, and, and actually, he, he, uh, he did. And um, he, he, um, he said that uh, he was told by this shaman that if, if the experience had its way, he would meet. He would meet his. Uh, he would meet his his demons. And um, his description of, of of that encounter was, he didn't uh, have a vision of his demons, but he actually met his demons. Do, do, do you know what I mean? That it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a an hallucination. There, it was it was more than more than that. And he and he said that because he had a lot of hallucinogenic encounters in his life in other ways. Do you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's, just an, it's just a very interesting uh, realm to and discuss. If, and even if you did literally see demons, as I have done, um, they could just be manifestations of your demons metaphorically as well, of course. Exactly. Another interesting thing is, I find, um, at least in my experience, the profusion of gothic kind of demonic imagery I yeah. mean, I, I have had the most beautiful gothic kind of visions, you know, um, and I wonder why. I'm not particularly interested in that kind of aesthetic. I mean, I don't yeah. mind it. I do like our gothic architecture, I suppose, as most people do, but yeah. um, why, why is that so prevalent? You know, skulls and, uh, you know, deadly wolves and <laughs> demons and, and things like yeah. that. It's just, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, well, then you wonder, then you wonder about the way in which... Uh, cultural ideas how deeply they get embedded in consciousness and that's where for me even when it comes to conversations about god and stuff um mm. yeah i, I'm, I'm I mean there's, all, there's also a sort of chicken egg thing um yeah. uh, aspect to that because you know aldous Huxley in his book heaven and hell which was the sequel to the doors of perception yeah. Um, he writes, the or, he, I mean, his speculation is the origin of religion is um, through some kind of psychedelic experience. I mean, you know, originally one wouldn't have called it that, but, you know, the experiences one had at the Eleusinian Mysteries in ancient Greece and so yeah. on, the Dionysian festivals and whatnot. Um, and so a lot of, I'm sure that a lot of cultural um, aesthetic sort of seeps into the, into the um, psychedelic experience, but at the same time, uh, the cultural aesthetic itself could have been, in many ways, um, inspired by these experiences. Because, of yeah. course, one doesn't have to take uh, psychedelics to have them. One can, you know, induce them through holotropic breath work or fasting yeah. or, or um, you know, infested weeds or whatever it may be. Yeah, so, yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's that a kind of, again, that's one of the interesting things within the... Um, realm of of religion you know with like visions and things like that you know i mean mm. if you do a lot of fasting <laughs> some strange things can happen yeah or if one's deprived of uh you know sensation like miners and caves and all their legends about goblins and whatever you know yeah one starts no. to see things um yeah interesting uh bringing back spinoza for a minute so i was looking at that recently i mean he he talks about three forms of knowledge. There's common opinion, there's um, scientific knowledge, as we'd call it today, and then there's a very rare intuition, as he calls it. And yeah. the peak of that is what he calls the intellectual love of God. And of course, we, we remember that for Spinoza, God is reality or nature or the one substance. Yeah. And um, But he says in passing in the ethics that this is what was meant by glory in the sacred texts. Yeah. And I find that a very interesting uh, thing that uh, can be analysed in terms of the psychedelic experience, and to my knowledge, no one has done that yet. But uh, this, the experience itself, is somewhat unitive. Um, it's uh, becoming one with nature, so one doesn't see it from one's particular attribute of mind, and yeah. uh, and uh, one then one also wonders: Did Spinoza have such intuitions? And in order to be to write about it and to emphasise it so much in the last part of his book, you know, what kind of visions, what kind of experiences were, was he having, and how, you know, by what means? So yeah. I think that due to the lack of <laughs> yeah, wish there'd been an appendix. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he was living in Amsterdam, right? Yeah, 
But, um, but I think that these experiences are much more common in the past than they are today because of lack of nutrition, you know, and, uh, and um, you know, fasting, religious fasting and whatnot, you know, I think they're just more, and that's perhaps explains the sort of um, greater adamancy in a lot of religious belief because of these strange visions that could not at the time have been ex explained in any other way. Yeah. Well, I remember I, w I was uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was with a bunch of uh, students uh, on a sort of theological journey in uh, Italy. And uh, part of the, the deal was a visit to um, Siena. And you know, Catherine of Siena mm. uh, had all of these um, visionary experiences. You know, this, this woman who had a profound impact on uh, sort of the church in in um, in her time and rose to be this kind of amazing figure who, in spite of being a woman, you know, dialogued with popes and, and all this kind of stuff. But essentially, she spent her whole life depriving herself of food and drink and uh, mm. basically, you know, willed herself to die at, at what she thought was the same age of Jesus, you know. And, and uh, she slept on a... Uh, a bench with a stone pillow. Um, she would only, you know, sounds like, sounds like an Asian. Yeah, yeah, but 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 you know, her life was marked by all of these sort of visionary experiences, and 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 my sort of interpretation, you know, without being too harsh, was that it's she just seemed kind of like uh, an anorexic, really, who'd kind of. Um, created a, a kind of religious narrative around these kind of, mm. uh, you know, these experiences rooted in deprivation that, that gave rise to, um, you know, I mean, you only have to stay up for a couple of days straight for your mind to start going a little nuts mm. yeah. <laughs> by, by conventional standards, you know what I mean? So if, if you live uh, in, in, in an environment where, where you're... Um, you know, doing extreme things to your body. Um, I, I, I think you will have uh, multiple old experiences and, and encounters, and then we frame that we cloak them in 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 the language uh, of of you know our perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean that's language or the language or or whatever. It's very similar to uh, Saint Teresa of Avila um, and Thank, her experiences. Yeah. You know, I mean, which are. I think, in, obviously, some of them are induced by sexual frustration. I mean, I yeah. remember reading one vision where she saw Jesus who had this long golden sword, and it, yeah. he thrust it into her, and it was extremely yeah. agonizing, but somehow amazingly pleasurable at the same time, you know? And you think, come yeah. on. I mean, you know, that's that's just too obvious. Yeah. Have you ever read, um, do you know who um, Amy Hollywood? No. She's a she's a um, a professor, I think, at Harvard School of Divinity or something like that. But she has this really really interesting book called Sensible Ecstasy, right? And it's about uh, female mystics uh, of the like twelfth and thirteenth century. Yeah, it's right. really worth a read. Yeah, okay, I'll look into that because it's quite interesting. Yeah, Jade, um, her her take on uh, what's going on, um, and uh, you know, she sort of puts a gender spin on, on uh, a lot of it, like why women, why female mystics had the experiences they had and what was involved in those experiences. I think, I think you'd find it kind of fascinating. Once I've um, finished what I'm doing, I'll, I'll look into that. I'm, I've written it down. But um, I must say, um, well, there's a danger as well, though. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if she wrote it, but generally speaking, um, that one thinks one can explain certain experiences by today's sort of general knowledge yeah. and dismiss old forms of knowledge, you know. My view yeah. is that they're both wrong, probably. <laughs> so, yeah. and also, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, we don't know, I mean, because of the hard problem of consciousness, the relationship between matter and mind, uh, we don't know that relation. We know they're correlated. We don't, yeah. we don't even know they're perfectly correlated. And we don't know what the means of correlation is, synchronicity, uh, or, or what uh, sort of uh, where um, sensors come to? I mean, the same neurons can be have a different sensible mode depending on their um, origin, the origin of their, their sensations. So we don't know 
we don't know whether you know mental the mental can have an effect upon the physical you know in terms of uh, free will or mental causation uh, we don't know how the mind could emerge from the brain you know uh, because there are no laws of physics which which show this so-called transordinal homology or bridge laws between matter and mind um, yeah. if the mind has no power which seems to be the way it has to be according to the laws of physics that why would yeah. the mind have evolved if it has no purpose and not only in humans but presumably in many organisms um, this is something that Bradley and Popper Karl Popper sort of argue against the epiphenomenalists so, so the ultimate point is we don't know this relationship and that's thus we've got this new term high problem consciousness but it's the same as the old problem the explanatory gap or even Leibniz's milk we just don't know so when um, we talk about these experiences and then people say, oh, well, it's a sort of a brain, you know, malfunction or something like this. I mean, you don't, that's not a good enough explanation if you don't know how the mind relates to the brain. Yeah. And also there's a lot of, interestingly, there's a lot of wish fulfillment, I believe, in modern um, reductive theories of, um, let's say, altered states of mind. Like, for example, you know, the incubus phenomenon, which is quite common, that you uh, wake up and there's... In the middle of the night and there's a goblin sitting on you or, or some yeah. figure at the end of your bed I mean it's very consoling to people to believe that that is a brain malfunction rather than something else yeah because it'd be absolutely terrifying to think there's some reality to that not that I'm saying there is sure but at the same time there's absolutely wish fulfillment in believing that it's a brain fuck up yeah and, of course. and and like I say without knowing the relationship between mind and matter, we cannot explain these things, even today. Yeah. So we can't say that, oh, well, you know, this mystic's uh, uh, experiences are all reducible to, like, um, a fault in the parietal lobe or something like that. It's just not possible. It's not a sufficient yeah. explanation. So anyway, so where does that leave us? In my view, it leaves us agnostic completely. You know, still, we don't have, we haven't got the right framework yet to explain these things. Yeah, and probably never will. Uh, probably not. I mean, this is Kant's whole thing that you know, a human uh, human cognition is totally limited, and um, this is also the view known as Mysterianism. I mean, Colin McGinn sort of promotes that the, these questions, yeah, absolutely are beyond our, our our remit. But I don't know. I'm hopeful. Thomas Nagel criticised that in this great essay called "The Psychophysical Nexus." He's he's got um, hope, and I'm hopeful. Um, but you know, you'll only find out if you try, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, and I, I certainly don't think that you shouldn't try. <laughs> I think it's, it's I, and I think it's really important not to settle for the the status quo or conventional wisdom when when you kind of grapple with this stuff. You have to push. You have to push and see. You know what you what you can uh, achieve. Push. Yeah. Also, also, it's, it's what makes it really interesting. You know, the mystery of it all. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. the interesting things. So um, also, I mean, it's possible that humans will advance, you know, in, t in evolutionary terms, in which case we can perhaps understand more in the future. Yeah, I'm beginning to wonder about that possibility. With or or de-evolve, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so um, where, so have you, have you, um, and you don't have to answer this, you don't want to, but have, have you sort of continued uh, experimenting or are you now sort of trying to work out from the experiences you've had what what you think it's all about or, or, or is there is so is there an ongoing experimentation alongside your ongoing philosophical reflection well as this might be publicized I'll say that legally I'm, I'm it's ongoing yeah so I'm uh, <laughs> going to strange countries where these things are legal and yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, experimenting absolutely yeah I mean it has to slow down a bit but um, no I mean it's necessary field work you know it's a practical it's what I call practical metaphysics yeah so metaphysics so far has been theoretical but now there's a practical element to it yeah um, and what uh, have you um, have you uh, how have those how is the the multiplicity of experiences played out um, in, in terms of like, do, uh, have you noticed particular things? Um, well, I do notice, I mean, is the one you, uh, no, it's so multifarious. I mean, that's what, that's what makes it such a huge task in a way. I mean, it's so yeah. multifarious. 
I mean, we say psychedelic experience, but that's a bit like saying human experience. Yeah. This is almost more than saying that. It's so huge as a whole landscape, mindscape to uh, map. And um, and that's what I'm. That's what I was talking about with regard to the phenomenology there, which yeah. cannot be done by a questionnaire. You know, did you feel united with the universe or something like that? You know, you need a new vocabulary completely, and you need someone who knows about phenomenology. I believe to go in there and explore. Yeah. You know, so they know how to make maps. Um, what I there are there are commonalities though certainly. So um, one one thing is just excessive. Uh, excessive feelings of beauty you know that's a very common thing for me um just extraordinary uh i mean it's the vision is one thing but the sort of um the registration of the vision as beautiful is very common with me and uh sometimes it's almost like it's just you're looking at uh the mindscape and then you know the eyes closed and then boom there's the perfect the form the ultimate form of beauty made manifest then you wait and then boom there's another one you know and it's almost like that and that that then sort of makes you wonder about plato's forms and form of beauty and the kind of exper experiences he had in the eleusinian mysteries with regard to that and um so that's one common thing beauty um sublimity you know um novelty which makes it hard to talk about i suppose um another interesting thing i've been considering recently is and this is related to Smithies and John Smithies. John Smithies was who inspired Aldous Huxley to write The Doors of Perception ultimately. He, uh, he references him at the beginning of the book saying he's the only professional philosopher he knows who's spoken about the masculine experience in terms of philosophy of mind. And yeah. um, I've been reading him lately and he's really fascinating. But one, one speculation, he's a, you know, a well-respected neuroscientist as well. He's still alive. He's working in San Diego at 95 years old. But anyway, he um, he was part of the whole um, Osmond and Huxley movement there in the fifties, with Masculine, H. H. Price, and others. Yeah. But um, he uh, he's got this book called The Analysis of Perception, nineteen fifty six, where he mentions Masculine. But he's got this theory about the phenomenal space, right? So we've got inf we've got three dimensions. At least we intuit we perceive three dimensions of physical space, and four with time. Um, but once, if we imagine like two triangles or two pyramids, or if we dream, or if we have psychedelic experiences or hypnagogia or whatever it may be, um, there is another spatiality there, right? Now, the interesting thing is, if let's say I imagine a pyramid, a blue pyramid, right, with my eyes closed, or if I see it in a psychedelic experience, that then we can assume will be correlated to neuro neural activity, but the spatial properties of the neurology will be completely distinct from you know the four sides of the pyramid and the angles and whatnot, right? So that, yeah. so that means so so for that reason he says the brain cannot be the mind by Leibniz's law, you know, um, mm. that two things with different properties cannot be numerically the same. So yeah. they cannot be the same thing. They are related, but they cannot be identical, as was a common theory in the 1950s from Place and yeah. Smart people like that. Um, and today, a lot of people still think you know the brain is the mind. But when you yeah. analyze that, you get into a lot of problems immediately like this and other properties like privacy as well but anyway so he says what is this visual space you know it, it sort of has an ex a reality of itself and then he he, he has he speculates um, and it can only be speculation here but he says maybe um there's two theory there's two sort of sub theories here it's visual space or let's call it imaginary space like dream space yeah. um can be limited to what you see or it gets quite radical here. It says it could extend further than what you see. So there could be, let's say, so that would imply, it doesn't say this, but it, the implication would be something like this. Um, what you see of a dream is not the entirety of the dream. In other words, the dream space extends beyond what you perceive of it, which yeah. is a fascinating thing. And, and, and it's possible both in, in metaphysical theories like idealism, but also in terms of emergentism, so sort of non-reductive physicalism, because there could be like two... Um, two brain processes working in parallel, one creating the space, the other the other nodule, um, as it were, looking into it, right? So you don't have to take an ontological view here for that possibility. But the interesting thing is the possibility remains, and with certain, like DMT, for example, you think you're looking into a world which is already out there. You think yeah. you're exploring it, and you've got, you've got 
sort of faint idea that when you close your eyes, or when, when you look away, when you open your eyes, rather, um, it doesn't go away, it's still there, you know? Um, yeah. And then you close your eyes again, and there you are, back in the same place. As it, you know, so it's not as if it suddenly disappeared when you opened your eyes, rather it stayed there. Yeah. And then you ask, well, if, that can't, if that's not part of physical space, as it cannot be, according to that, the logic no. that I just mentioned, then what what is that you know what where what where is it you know what is the <laughs> ontological status of that and immediately you get into metaphysics but the interesting thing is um, you can explore it much more vividly eidetically with psychedelics you know because you can really um, you know sort of fly within these very solid and intricate mindscapes spacescapes you know I mean as detailed as you know the room around you now. Yeah, and that's what it provides. It allows for that real voyage rather than um, sort of a travelling by Google Maps. You, know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you might actually even get there. <laughs> yeah. Have you um, have you come across uh, anybody else do it like contemporaries doing work in 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 this realm, like the intersections of philosophy in particular with um, this? There are a few of us, yeah. I mean, Chris Leatherby is an Australian philosopher who I met once in London, and he's he's a uh, he's he's looked into it. Although he's a naturalist, like a lot of Australians, so um, yeah, he sort of uh, tries to reduce it to physicality. Something I I don't do. I think it's sort of inca in unintelligible uh, concept, really, phys physicalism. But yeah. but nonetheless, what he does is very very good and very interesting. Um, there are. Um, there are other thinkers who, who are not necessarily like philosophers as such. They might be sociologists, anthropologists, but doing a lot of interesting work. Um, but there are, interestingly, very few metaphysicians or philosophers, philosophers of mind who are doing it, except yeah. for like John Smithies. Um, he's a guy I've come across recently who I wish I had known a few years ago. But um, but there's so much there's so much more to be done, and I think that it will be done when when people, when when these substances now in the Renaissance, as it were, sort of become uh, more acceptable, less faux pas. Yeah, uh, you know, there'll be more funding available, um, and there'll be more interest generally. I mean, the interesting thing when I speak about psychedelics at university, all the professors, staff are very interested, fascinated. They tell yeah. me they often tell me, oh yeah, you know what? Let me tell you, you know, so where, and once I took, you know, blah blah, but um, they they they're never sort of. Um, explicitly writing about these things because this, I suppose they're essentially quite scared, you know, like tenure at university is very, very yeah. unstable these days and you don't want tenure, to... Tenure, tenure. <laughs> yeah, so it's just, um, but, you know, it's it's slowly going that way and, I'm, and um, I think there's also a need for philosophers here, but in terms of the psychedelic renaissance, just to show, or metaphysicians rather, because you know, so much then is reduced to the brain. You know, we see, oh yeah, this brain activity, the brain is more connected or less connected when we when yeah. this happens, whatever, um, as if that's an explanation. It's not, it's not, it's just, let's say, I mean, let's theoretically analyze this. You know, if you've got a perfect understanding of what goes on in the brain when yeah. you're on a high dose of DMT, that hasn't, that you know, that's something people expect already. It doesn't explain yeah. anything. I mean, we can just assume that already. I mean, as J. Wong Kim, this great philosopher of mind, says, you know, like correlation is um, the question, not the answer. You know, the question is, why do they correlate? Yeah. And further, oh. explanation, you know, a, a, pu a purely physical explanation is not a sufficient explanation. You need the phenomenological explanation or at least description as well. And uh, but I think I think this is lost in many ways. You know, like there's so much hope. Like, OK, let's just um, let's just put money in for brain imaging. You know, let's yeah. fund this, and, and eventually, you know, hope maybe we'll understand it all. But it's just, I mean, it's just not going to happen that way. We'll have to yeah. expand the whole framework of science in order to to begin begin yeah. a better explanation here. Yeah, I wonder sometimes if um, the 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 funding for like research that goes on, and you know, because I think was it last week? It's like University College London or somewhere got funding to do some. Micro dosing. Oh yeah, um, the Imperial College with yeah, the Imperial Beckley College, Foundation. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the the that that realm of of research tends to be very much in the arena that you just mentioned, and it's kind of the utilitarian purpose of um, psychedelics in 
you know, curing what ails us, you know, depression, anxiety. I mean, that's what I've got from quite a few of the books that I've read recently, you know, Michael Pollan's book, yes. you know, about um, LSD, you know, how to change your mind, yeah. and uh, even Tao Lim's book, Trip, you know, which is more about um, his experiments with psilocybin and stuff. But a lot of it definitely leans towards the kind of, puts it in the, the kind of medicinal realm. Which, you know, I, on, on one level uh, is, I think, perhaps a, a helpful part of the equation of, of the, the drugs and the, and the experience. But it's, it's far from the whole picture. In fact, it's probably just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what really needs to go on. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the potential is to radically change the framework of explanation in the sciences or vision, better word is Wissenschaft, you know, the Germans, which include... Some yeah. philosophy within knowledge, knowledgeology as well, um, wisdom craft. But um, that's the potential, yeah. I mean, the therapy is, it, in a way, it's understandable. It's like people can't be against psychedelics if they treat, you know, depression and bipolar it's, disorder and whatever, you know. You'd be a cruel bastard to oppose that, yeah. right? So that's a great way to make it mainstream and acceptable. But yeah. um, we shouldn't we shouldn't stop there. And I think a lot of people realise that. But, of course, yeah. this is the... Uh, the reintegration of it, yeah, but um, but the potential that's just negative. That's just, I mean, a, a positive negative, as it were. It's like a great value, of course, in treating people, but that's just, yeah, the first step. And there's just so much more um, there to be discovered. I mean, they could even be means to sort of um, progress mankind. So, so uh, yeah, so we should be wary of reducing uh, these experiences to brain activity and to medicine, absolutely. Yeah, I think I mentioned that um, uh, book to you, um, Narco Capitalism, that yeah. sort of plots in some ways the the way in which we've become immersed since the invention of anesthesia in this kind of uh, chemical sort of dulling of the mind, you know, dulling of the minds in the service of capitalism, kind of mm. kind of thing, and and it's a little bit of a worry if if that's the only. Uh, result of explorations of, of yeah. psychedelics. It's very interesting, actually, that in, in terms of um, Penzance man Humphrey Davy, so Humphrey Davy, right? Because, yeah. um, so if you if you haven't heard of him, he, you know, he sort of discovered uh, barium, magnesium, he invented the miner's safety lamp, saved loads of many lives. Um, but did nothing with his life for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, second scientist to be knighted after Newton, anyway. He, uh, so he, he was the first to, you know, methodologically experiment with nitrous oxide in, yeah. uh, in Bristol in 1799, like I said. But um, it, it, people always, here's an interesting little uh, note. You know, people always say it's so bizarre because when he was taking nitrous oxide, he mentions like once, twi twice actually, in his book, Researches on Nitrous Oxide, 1800, he, he says, oh yeah, you know, I had a toothache and I took this nitrous oxide and it sort of subdued my pain, you know. And, uh, and he mentions it another time as well. And people always remark, well, that's odd, isn't it? That's the greatest thing about nitrous oxide, uh, the anesthetic effects. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, and like, he just mentions it in passing. But this is the interesting thing, yeah. So, I mean, it became an anesthetic about 40 years later in America. And it was um, Edgar Allan Poe's cousin, George Poe, was the person yeah. who sort of created it in bulk, strangely. But anyway, that was 40 years later. Humphrey Davy himself, who was doing all the sort of chemical and philosophical, phenomenological even research into it, it, the anaesthetic uh, value of it was just like like an off-the-cuff remark, you know. For him, the yeah. interesting thing of it really was the phenomenology, you know, the interesting, what we would today call perhaps mystical states that it induces. Yeah. And this was like the first scientific psychonaut, Humphrey Davy. You know, he really was. First Western scientific psychonaut. Oh. So it's funny how, um, yeah, these things have changed. I mean, probably because of, you know, I haven't read that book you mentioned, but commercialization of nitrous oxide as a medicine, as an anesthetic, made us look at, look at it this way. Yeah. But, but like for Humphrey Davy and for me and for many others, you know, the interesting thing is the phenomenology. Yeah. And uh, what's, uh, where, what, are you, what, what are you planning? I mean, are you going to teach this stuff? <laughs> Ideally, like, yeah. But... Uh, yeah. Right? I mean, well, there's no course on it at the moment, but of course that could happen. Um, I think there are 
there is speak of uh, creating courses and even degrees, degrees on it. And I think that's probably going to come, um, but not yet. But at the moment, I'm sort of reduced to speaking about it at different venues and uh, yeah. write, writing about it. I've got a new um, collection of essays on mostly psychedelic experience coming out in the winter, I hope. Um, but um, yeah, eventually, I mean, you know, another reason I didn't want to do a PhD on psychedelics is because of the lack of literature, you know, and psychedelics, they love the references, you know, you sort of yeah, have yeah. to refer, but there's just not, not that much to refer to, you see. So, yeah. um, but by creating a course, um, you'll, you'll start to create literature on it. So, yeah, I mean, that's actually a good idea. Thanks. You know, I might, might do that. Yeah, no, you really should. <laughs> you should do it. You should do it online. I've got a lot of people. Yeah, maybe that's an interesting idea. Actually, someone asked has offered me to do that. Asked me to do that for them, and I uh, didn't have time. But I, uh, yeah, actually, that is a good idea. Might do that. I could stay in my little village in Cornwall that way as well. Yeah. Exactly. You just have to, <laughs> all you need is the internet, mate. Yeah. <laughs> and the mushrooms that grow around my my garden. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> They're quite prolific here, actually. Yeah. Well, you know. Cornwall, Cornwall is bathed in a certain mysticism, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, it's um, full of uh, druids, even today, and uh, stone circles and coits and uh, underground caverns, of which are like, you know, 3,000 years old or whatnot. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Did, oh God, did you ever, and oh, I shouldn't even reference it because I can't even remember <laughs> The, the book now there's a book that came out in the 70s it was written um it was about um the sacred mushroom and christianity did you ever read that book yeah um by uh yeah. his name Hold on, it's on my bookshelf i'm gonna have to find it <laughs> so, um i know the one you're talking about though yeah um yeah <laughs> I, John, uh, it? yeah what is it anyway um i don't know why that even came up but um like, oh, it came up because uh, it's, oh, the sacred mushroom and the cross, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, who's the guy? Is it John somebody? Uh, John, John Allegro. Yeah, that's it. John Allegro, yeah, yeah, yeah. Read it many years ago, yeah. <laughs> that's a I mean, I, I think that book's actually getting a little bit of a revisit, I've heard. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, I think some of the, you know, I, I think because he had that image you know, he used that image from the from the plain Corot fresco mm. that looks like Adam and Eve. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. the tree of life, but it looks like you know, um, magic mushroom tree. And apparently, he was convinced that by some that it was just a a very early way of um, depicting the tree of life. So I think he took it out of um, the book, but then it came back in, and there's some there's some rediscovery of that. I, I guess what I was my, my, my point is, is there's a little thread of, of this within the horizon, or on the fringes of uh, Christian thought and reflection, you know, I mean, yeah. well, you know, modern Christianity uh, is so rooted in rationalism, you know, that it's very hard, even mystical experiences are, you know, mm -hmm. under the rubric of logic, but um it's. it's uh, I, I think I'm sort of fascinated to see if this conversation has any um, impact on uh, Christian theology. I'm not sure that I, I hold out too much hope, but you never know. Well, there maybe there's some connection also to the notion of angels, you know, and the entities that are seen on many psychedelic experiences. And if there's yeah. any um, sort of overlap there, it could be. I'm sure people have written about that. Um, yeah, no, I mean... I mean, Christian mysticism and psychedelics, I mean, that's surely a fruitful discourse. And I know that books have been written about it, as you mentioned, but um, yeah, so much more. I, I had a personal experience. I mean, you know, being as sceptical as I am, I sort of kind of dismissed it, but it was a very, very Christian thing. I, um, I was at this on psilocybin, um, suddenly this huge cliff face appeared before me in the dark and a huge crack burst open in it vertically and then mm. and then a huge crack horizontally creating this huge breaking cross in front of my eyes or eyes and vertical commas. and um yeah. and it was sort of ob the intuition was you know this is the truth you know this huh. is it right and i was and i even 
on psilocybin, I mean, I was sort of awestruck, but at the same time I thought, well, you don't have to be careful to interpret that in any particular way. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so <and> then, <laughs> yeah. But of course, for many people, that would be um, quite, an, quite a, you know, sort of a almost conversion experience. It, I, it depends on who you are, I suppose. Also, I had very devil. I saw, you know, in contradistinction, well, in one way, contradistinction, I saw this huge devil figure, like a sort of minotaur almost, you know, horned, huge... Uh, humanoid kind of demon figure sort of intently with his head down but sort of almost staring at me and I realized it was the devil and then suddenly we flipped and I became him which was oh. like a very strange experience um, but you know not 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 uh, unpleasant you know but anyway yeah. um, there's so much religious imagery and uh, intuition uh, through psilocybin experiences that, that no doubt a theologian um, especially interested in mysticism, should experiment with these things to gain further insights. I mean, yeah. without doing it, you're almost not doing your job. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I almost think that with philosophy, philosophers of mind now, you know, um, if you haven't experienced, uh, you know, like consciousness beyond the prosaic, you're, yeah. you're not really someone who can speak about consciousness. I'm beginning to, I, I know it sounds very haughty, but I mean, it's sort of. It's just true. Well, yeah, I mean, that, you know, again, it, it comes down to the the work of theory and prax, you know, and and then the kind of praxis dynamic and and actually, you know, putting some skin in the game. I think if you're, if you're interested in explaining it to others and to yourself, I mean, you don't have to do that. You can just sort of appreciate the experience itself. But I think there's obviously this drive to sort of somehow grasp it, you know, somehow understand what's going on, how it relates to your life and reality generally, because it could yeah. have implications for, for the afterlife even and, and, uh, and society and evolution. I mean, it's just so profound, really. Yeah. It's just such a great tool. That's so interesting. Well, uh, I think <laughs> we've been talking for a while. I should probably wrap up, but, um, but thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to chat, it's uh, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time about about. I mean, there's lots of other things we could talk about as well, but I just wanted to really focus on on your work because I really appreciated. Um, well, it's uh, just a pleasure. I mean, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I really it, liked, it's, it's I really actually, liked I really liked your book, and I I, I don't know um, if it's got. Um, I, I'm I'm trying to pitch it to people that I know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, so well, it yeah, it's called Newman Nautics, and it's um, you can get it on Amazon. It's the best place to get it now, actually. And can you just tell me, because I, I don't want to fuck, how do you pronounce <laughs> your last name? Uh, the anglicized version is Shurstedt H. Oh, Shurstedt H. Yeah, H is but, for Hughes, but he, I just find that too too long, um, and so yeah. I, got, I shortened it down. And then I sort of regretted it, but now it's too late because it's on my book. So that's the way it is. Yes. That's kind of cool. It's it's like a half double barrel name. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Yeah. So no. so you're not quite landed gentry. Yeah. No. But half peasant. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, all peasant, really. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Peace. It's great chatting, and I hope we can talk again soon. Yeah. No. Definitely. Real pleasure. Thanks a lot for um for inviting me. All right, mate. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.